Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Apothecary Curator. If if you're good to just jump right in. I'm good to just jump right in. Let's go. I'm... I think you should go first today because I've gone first the last couple times, but I did get an email. So I wanted to take just a quick second ahead of time. So we are not experts, you and I, as we consistently remind everyone. (laughs) Oh, goodness me, no. (laughs) But despite that, we we do, um, we are as liable and vulnerable as anyone else to the habit of getting into just sort of throwing around acronyms and never actually describing them or really like remembering that. Sometimes the, our particular lexicon is not shared by everybody. So I just want to take a second because I got an email from somebody uh, the other week basically being like, hey, I love your show. It's awesome. I love word stuff. What are you talking about when you keep saying pirate? And they thought they, they had heard it as one word. Pirate. It's like P-I-R-O-O-T. Cool. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the person that sent the email, but I sent an email back to them, but it's been bouncing back and lagging and there's something wrong with it. So I wanted just to maybe just take 10 seconds right quick to be like, when we say pie root or pie, capital P-I-E. I'm, I'm now a little bit curious because, you know, we're not experts. And I, I feel like if you had put us each in a separate recording booth and we had been asked individually, what are pie roots? I feel like we might give slightly different answers. Just oh, to, that would be just, fun just because that would be a little bit hilarious. And it would also very, very much be. expose our non-expertry. Yes. But, um, well, do, do you want to go first and give me your take on pirates? And if I have anything to add, I can do that or vice versa. Sure. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's do that. Like, because I've been working on it. So. Cool. Good. That's, that's <laughs> I mean, probably I say working better on than it. my off-the-cuff, possibly made-up take. Yeah, I say I, I say working on it. I say like a, a week and a bit ago, I responded to an email with as detailed an explanation as I could manage and then haven't thought about it much since then. But it would have been fun. I should have thought of doing two separate ones because I bet it, I bet they would be a little different. In, in my understanding, so PI, P-I-E, Proto-Indo-European, and it's basically a theorized or hypothetical language that, and not theory like, Closer to theory of evolution as opposed to conspiracy theory. Hey guys, I someday have a theory. we'll do theory because it's it's like historical linguists have posited that this language exists based on a lot of support for their presumptions. So the fact that languages like Sanskrit and Latin and you know some Germanic languages and all these dis- different languages, completely different groups of people, but they all have a lot of similarities in a lot of their words and vocabulary. And so historical linguists and um, other such actual experts have theorized this language called Proto-Indo-European, which was common to a common ancestor to all of those other modern languages. And we don't have like written evidence of it. We don't have a certainly not a grammar or even a complete lexicon. But what people have developed is... Uh, a fairly extensive collection of root words from the Proto-Indo-European language. So when you say pi, it's a pi root, is this theorized common element that then these various languages get their modern words from. So like, uh, I think the pi root for water, which was either qua or aqua, came up the other day, the other episode. And so they figure that's what it was because of all kinds of expert reasons that I don't understand because I'm not an expert, but they base it on the way the word for water is similar across these otherwise very distinct languages. So that's what we mean when we say a pie root. And there are resources online and obviously in actual meat space books that have long lists of these root words and the various cognate words that have come up from them in various languages and such. Yeah, that sounds good to me. 
I uh, I usually if if I was talking to someone who like really has no clue whatsoever about about such things, I would usually start off with the analogy of the the Tower of Babel. Right. And to imagine that once upon a time everybody spoke the same our language, um, and then something I'd like to think it was something as cool as a good smiting because who doesn't enjoy a good smiting? Uh, pr- presumably the smote don't like the, yeah, it all that the, much. But, the smitten don't like but, it, but you know. Otherwise, the, uh, the 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 onlookers to the smiting, the smite witnesses, they they tend to enjoy it. But um, yeah, so so just as you say, if you want to know more, and I think this this counts for pretty much any aspect of etymology and his- history of language, check out Kevin Stroud's podcast, The History of English. Yes. It's awesome for lots of reasons, but there is a very, very good episode. I think I think it's actually a two-part episode about Proto-Indo-European. Uh, cool fun fact about Proto-Indo-European. Uh, w- we probably wouldn't have it if it wasn't for uh, Jacob Grimm out of off of the Brothers Grimm. As oh. in the collectors of the fairy tales, I think it's Jacob. I I might be mistaken. It might be William, but um, yeah, he, he Proto Indo European is is one of these it's one of these things that makes me just absolutely boggle at the sheer tenacity of scholars. Yeah, because the the sheer amount of of nerd hours required to say in I don't know I'm 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 going to take a punt and say that there are like. 15 Indo-European languages that's probably a conservative estimate particularly when you think about you know historical languages that yeah. don't really aren't really spoken anymore but have roots here and there in various places but you know it's it's a lot of languages to look at to then say I wonder if the words for a thing in all of these languages might have any similarities like that that's already <laughs> too big a task for me to fit in my brain yeah never mind actually say Okay, I'm going to do that. How do I go about doing that? Where do I look, and how long is this going to take me? So, yeah, it it really is. I just think it's it's a super impressive body of work, from the sheer, like, a number of hours required to, to actually establish that that Proto Indo European exists. Yeah, absolutely. Also, it sounds like pie, and pie is delicious. Pie is delicious. So, you know. Meat pies, savoury pies, sweet pies. We're a fan of all things pie. They're all good. Yeah. So there's pie root. And absolutely, like, just to... Inc- I was really happy that that yes. listener had emailed that in. I was in. just going to say the same so thing. So if we do have these things that we get kind of thrown around, that we sort of throw around and you don't get it, just 100%, please just email. Um, or contact, you know, through Facebook or Twitter or on the Reddit page or wherever else you happen to be comfortable dropping us a line because yeah we like hearing from you and if I, we're saying I, something that you're confused I'm about really... you, the answer is no to the question of am i the only one who like the answer is no so oh yeah it's absolutely no yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm particularly pleased that, that our emailer did get in touch because uh, this is one of the things that i hate most about <laughs> it particularly comes up in the context of meetings like if you are part of any kind of corporate structure then you have to go to meetings where people use acronyms yeah. and they assume that you know what the acronyms are and it's one of my absolute pet hates about that 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 whole kind of structure of of things and so if i am in a meeting where i'm supposed to be paying attention and listening and such like, and being a professional, and someone uses an acronym that I've never heard before and that I don't know the meaning of, then the rest of my time and mental energy in that meeting will be spent coming up with quote-unquote humorous alternatives. <laughs> yeah. Like, that that's... Uh, people, like, people who manage me know this about me. <laughs> They're now like, are you writing poems? Are you coming up with acronyms? Are you drawing? What are you doing? And I'm like, it, it could be any or all of those things, but um, I, I'm trying. That's, you know, sometimes sometimes meetings are just too bullshitty for, for me not to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, my, my manager's aware of that and she's aware of my email, my private email policy. Um, but she doesn't like me to talk about it because it upsets her. <laughs> that's super. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that another day. <laughs> Um, cool. Right. So, 
Okay, Take it away. to the words. So I mentioned last time that I had been reading the very wonderful A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness. Yes. And I'm going to give another shout out to this book because it's it's really properly wonderful in ways that I, I am continuing to love it, even though I, I've sort of read it and digested it and thought about it. I'm now teaching it to a group of young people whose responses to it are just superb. So the, the, the pleasure of the book goes on kind of thing. And um, without wishing to spoil the book, I, I wouldn't do that, but th there is a... There's a story in the book that mentions the, the word that I'm going to talk about today okay. that I was interested in purely because it's such a lovely word to say. And the word is apothecary. Oh, I do like that word. It's just like, just to say it a couple of, it tastes good. Apothecary. Yeah. And it's a little bit arcane and a little bit, what does that mean anyway? And... Who are those guys and, and all that, you know, all, all that sort of like slight mystery kind of stuff that's going on uh, make, makes me like this word. So it, it was a word that I was kind of like, every time I hear it, part of me is like, yay. Anyway, and this was before I, I started looking at its, its etymology, which I also found quite interesting. So. Very cool. Apothecary. I, I particularly was interested in the OED's entry for this word because if you're familiar with the OED online or if you're familiar with the OED in, in print version, you'll know that an entry generally runs thusly. There's the, the word that's being defined. There's a pronunciation guide. There are various forums listed, historical forms. Um, it's frequency, it's etymology. And then the main part of the entry looks at different definitions for the word and gives historical citations as to when that word was first found in print to the best of their knowledge. And for some words, which, you know, we, we talk about this a lot, for some words there are several meanings, um, several usages, historically words change, yada, 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 all that stuff. Um, and you get the citations and you can see how old the word is, roughly speaking. So here's what's cool about the entry for the word apothecary. The first definition doesn't have any citations. Oh. Yeah. Uh, which which seems to indicate to me, this this is the best that I could kind of find out, seems to indicate to me that it is known that this word once had this meaning, but so far there aren't any written citations which actually prove this. Oh, that's weird. So the, the kind of slightly like arcane, nobody really understands nature of the word apothecary also fits with the, the you know, I, I consider the OED to be a pretty good source. <laughs> it's a definitive, you know, history of, of uh, large parts of our language, but, but not in the case of the word apothecary. So I'm going to go straight to definition number two. And definition number two has a, a whole list of, of written citations, the first of which comes from 1366, okay? And it's defined as an apothecary, one who prepared and sold drugs for medicinal purposes. The business now, since about 1800, conducted by a druggist or pharmaceutical chemist. From about 1700, apothecaries gradually took a place as general medical practitioners, and the modern apothecary holds this status legally by examination and license of the apothecary's company. But in popular usage, the term is archaic. So it's archaic. It's an oldie timey word for a profession that still exists, but we don't call it apothecary anymore. Yeah. Which is a real shame as far as I'm it concerned. It really is. Because I like the notion of going to the apothecary. And... That sense stays pretty stable. So the first citation is from 1366. The latest that's listed in the OED is from 1809. We also get, in, uh, in sense number three, we get uh, the wares or shop of a drug seller. So if you go to the apothecary, you may be going to see a person, but you may be going to a premises wherein you will find that person. Right. And this is from 1561, and the latest cita citation is from 1621. So going to the apothecary um, 
was a thing that people did in these times. There are a lot of uh, European languages that, that have hung on to that word in that sense. So in, in German, for example, apothe, apothetic, I think it is. Not a German speaker, excuse me if I'm uh, mashing your language. But, but <laughs> this word is used in German to mean chemist. So, so that's pretty fine. And um, the fourth definition given in the OED, first in 1562 and lastly in 1614, is uh, an attributed... Attributed... I'm just going to start again. I like this. Attributive <laughs> oh, okay. quasi-adjective. So, apothecary wares such as shall be pure and perfect good. Oh, okay. To set up apothecary shops. Right. Apothecary scourings given her. I should point out, normally when I fluff my words like this, I might make a joke by saying something along the lines of, I'll put my teeth back in. Right. Um, today I am actually missing a tooth. Oh. I mean, it's not a real tooth. I I don't know if I've told, I don't know if I've talked about this or not. I'm in the process of having veneers fitted to my front two teeth. Okay. Because of a, a small incident that happened 12-ish years ago involving my face and the floor of a drinking establishment we both know well <laughs> in a little place called Chongju Shi. <laughs> yes. And since then, <clears throat> my two upper front teeth have been pretty grey. Um... Dear listener, I was wearing <laughs> silly shoes and drinking ill-advisedly and I fell over <laughs> and one of my teeth fell out. It landed on the floor of said drinking establishment and I was looked after by some very capable Kiwis who took me to the bathroom, made me spit out a lot of blood, cleaned me up, got the tooth, sanitised it in some way do you know what? I, I'm a little bit horrified. I don't even know what happened to that tooth before it was, <laughs> with no great ceremony, inserted back into my gum. I did then go to Kiwis, a hospital man. and to a dentist. Uh, I saw an emergency dentist. I still remember the poor woman's just awakened from slumber face. Um, and she asked me if in Korean if I had been drinking. And I replied with my not very great Korean with the word that means a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. No greater <laughs> understatement has, has ever been made. Anyway, so <laughs> the state of my two front teeth has since then been um, a little bit shonky. So I finally decided to get something done about it. I don't know if you know about veneers and, and what happens. I certainly didn't before I, I, I started undergoing the process. But you basically, you go to the dentist, they take a load of impressions to see what your teeth look like. Then they drill away a couple of millimetres of the surface of the tooth. That wasn't very pleasant. No. Um, you're left with sort of like little vaguely tooth-shaped pegs that the porcelain shell of the veneer is, is attached to. Oh, okay. In the meantime, so that you don't actively terrify people, they make you temporary teeth ah. to put over the top. And then, you know, the impressions go away to the technician and they construct the veneers and all the rest of it. But because teeth are very individual and different and because you know it's my face um, yeah. you then get a series of fitting appointments and they often the veneers have to go kind of back and forward to the technician to, to get sorted out so the first time I went to have them tried on I thought they looked great but my dentist who is a, a, a very capable semen woman she wasn't happy so she sent them back to the laboratory to have them sorted and then the second time they came back and they basically they'd overcorrected the, the problem. So oh. annoyingly, I I was supposed to go back last Monday and then a stupid COVID test got in the way. So my dentist obviously wasn't at her work. So I'm going tomorrow to hopefully have my actual teeth fitted. Nice. But they yeah, so they make you temporary teeth, but the deal with the temporary teeth is they have to be taken off to, to try the veneers on. Right. So they try to make them sturdy enough that they'll stay on your tooth. But they also try not to stick them on too firmly so that they can take them off when they need to. Long story right. short, I've been back to the dentist three times to have my fake tooth glued back on. Wow. It fell off last night. The appointment's on Monday. I'm not, you know, I'm not crying about it, but I, I do actually have a, a meth addict looking front tooth. Um, and... A little bit of a th 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 oh, yeah. thing going on when I'm speaking. Yeah. Anyway, so that's that's my tale. 
Apologies <laughs> for the interruption. So the apothecaries and their attributive uh, adjectives, they've, they've been the, the people dealing in cures, medicines, for, for a very, very, very long time. Now, when you look at the etymology of the word, the etymology brings us back very, very firmly to the first definition given in the OED, the one which doesn't actually have any written citations. Oh, okay. And that's because apothecary is one of these words that's basically been built from Greek pieces. Right. And I, I quite love those words. Things like arachnophobia, spider fear. Yeah. Boom, does what it says on the tin. And apothecary is, is the same. So Etym Online has this to say about it. It's from the late Latin apothecarius, which means storekeeper. From Latin apotheca, meaning storehouse. From Greek apotheke, meaning barn or storehouse. Oh. So an apotheca is literally a place where things are put away. Interesting. And we can see this because it's a word that contains not one, but two Proto-Indo-European roots. Neat. Which is quite cool, because that doesn't happen very often. So first of all, we have the root apo, A-P-O, and apo is that sort of precursor to prefixes like ab and oh, okay. of. Right. It's generally defined as off, from, away from, separate, part of, yada, yada, yada. It's from Greek, from, or away from, or after, or in descent from. So it's actually a root that's part of many, 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 many words. Having a look at the, the Picorni Index from the University of Texas at Austin, we see that it, it just it, it gives us a gabillion words, basically. That's my, my highly scientific um, <laughs> yeah. assessment. A billion words. And there are just as many billions of words in... Middle English as there are in, in English, but and in Old English there are lots and lots of them. So we have words like any ab prefixed words. We have words like ablout and abrupt, after and all the many compound words aftermath, after life. Um, we have opposite and apposition, awkward, component and compound and deposit, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Right. And because apo out or out of or away from is, is, you know, it's one of these little, a lot of bang for, for its buck, like like empty was. Yes, yeah. So you, you find this root in all sorts of places from post-mortem to dispose. And in the sense of the word apothecary, of course, it means to, um, to kind of put, to put a thing and then we come to our second root. And the second root... Sorry, I've, I've done that the other way around. I'll correct myself in a minute. The second root okay. is D-H-E, however that's pronounced. Because, right. you know, with pi, we might as well make it up because yeah. that's what everybody else is doing. The, the D root, D-H-E, means to set or to put. So ah, we have okay. apple and to set or to put. Essentially, a place to put things away. Right. Interesting. And the set or put has just as long a list of cognates as apple does. It has, it gives us words like abdomen and oh. affair and artifice and condiment and hacienda and hypothesis and satisfy and verify. And, you know, just my goodness. Wow. And again, to, to come back to our, our conversation at the start about pi roots, when you look at a list like this and realise that this root is the common ancestor or is arguably the common answer, ancestor for all of these words just in English, you can see what an absolutely enormous mind-boggling task it must have been to compile a list like this. The Etym Online entry for this pi root also talks about other languages, you know, where the hypothetical 
hypothetical source or the evidence for its existence is provided by here it lists words from Sanskrit, from Avestan, from Old Persian, from Hittite, from Greek, from Latin, Lithuanian, Polish, Russian, Old High German, German and Old English. It's it's just such an, an absolute minefield, minefield to have all of these uh, this huge body of words that ultimately can be traced back to this tiny little root, three little letters. Yeah. So, in an, apoth in an apotheca, the Latin word which came from the, the Greek word, we have a place to put things away, which is how apothec, a barn or apotheca storehouse came to have its meaning. And thus, the apothecary was the person who was in charge of the storehouse and the person who put things away, the storekeeper. Gotcha. Now, you might be wondering, how come there's a word for apothecary when there's also a word for, like, grocer? You know, how is it that, that the, the two different types of storekeeper, uh, you know, are they completely different types of storekeeper? Right. And is that why they have two different names? Or, you know, what, what's going on with that? So I, I'll come back to the, the OED, which has, as its first definition for the word apothecary originally one who kept a store or shop of non-perishable commodities spices drugs comfits preserves etc and it says underneath this past an early period into the next in 1617 the apothecaries company of london was separated from the grocers oh. now i don't know about you but when i read a sentence like that i think one thing fight yeah Best rumble ever. <laughs> and and I find myself wondering about um, the, the, the very exciting phrase, the apothecary's company. Yeah. So I did a little bit of digging and I found that, in fact, there is a worshipful society of apothecaries. What? That is a thing. And the worshipful society of apothecaries... <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, so the, the apothecaries.org is their website and it starts by saying the word apothecary is, divine, is derived from apotheca meaning a place where wine, spices and herbs were stored during the 13th century it came into use in this country to describe a person who kept a stock of these commodities which he sold from his shop or street stall and what, when we're talking about companies like this especially these honourable companies we're talking about companies within the city of London Right. And we're talking about companies with a capital C and the, the collective word to describe these particular companies is livery companies. Now, livery, as the, you know, you can use this word on its own to mean the same thing. Livery is a, a uniform or the, the dress worn by a particular profession or a particular um, job person. Job person, yes. That's the word profession, Amy. <laughs> Job For some person. reason, I needed both of those definitions. Um, yeah, so <laughs> the London Apothecaries were originally members of another livery company, the Grocers. And together, you'll like this one, Ryan. Together, these tradesmen can be traced back to the Guild of Pepperers. Oh, that an is... association formed in the city in 1180. That's amazing. The Guild of Pepperers. <laughs> They were once a thing. Oh, that's so cool. And um, in 1180, they, they were enough of a thing that, that they formed their own guild. And of course, the guild system, which immediately immediately makes me think of Terry Pratchett, because Ankmore Park, the fictional city in his fantastical Discworld, which is, I think, quite obviously based on cities like London and other large cities with a very, very long history, um, they have guilds. There's a thieves' guild and a seamstresses' guild and a assassins' guild and all these sorts of things. Yeah. And the guilds were comprised of rich and powerful members of these particular professions, and they looked out for the interests of that that profession. There are, however, within London, certainly there are 110 livery companies. Wow. They contain such delights as. The Worshipful Company of Girdlers. <laughs> the Worshipful Company of Pewterers. Oh. The Worshipful Company of Musicians. The Worshipful Company of Upholders. Upholsterers. Oh, okay. And 
if you're into oldie worldy professions, yes. this is a really, really great list to have a look at. Oh. This is just a list on, on Wikipedia. If you look up livery companies, you, you'll find that, that they're all there. So we have Coopers and Fletchers and Plumbers and Glovers and Glass Sellers. And, and then latterly we have things like, so number 81, there's an honourable company of air pilots. Oh. Scientific instrument makers, actuaries, chartered architects, firefighters, tax advisors. And uh, it, it's a really, really interesting little snapshot into history of commerce. Yeah. And the, the apothecaries, the apothecaries come in at number 58 in this list of 110 companies. And the order itself is quite an interesting feature because the, um, the first 12 on the list they are considered to be the, the great 12 city livery companies. And the first 12 are, they're all worshipful companies. So we right. have mercers, which is a word meaning general merchant. Then we have grocers, then drapers, wool and cloth merchants, fishmongers, goldsmiths, skinners, fur traders, merchant tailors, as in tailors who make clothes, uh, haberdashers, Salters, traders of salts and chemicals, ironmongers, vintners, wine merchants, and cloth workers. Wow. Those are the Great Twelve. And the Great Twelve were um, in, in 1515, again, this is from Wikipedia, the Court of Aldermen of the City of London decided on an order of precedence. At that time, there were 48 livery companies in existence. But they, they weren't ranked historically. They were basically ranked on the economic or political power of those particular companies. Right. So the, the Great Twelve, they were the richest and they were the most powerful at that point in 1515 when the Court of Aldermen decided that there was going to be a precedence. And within the Great Twelve, the Worshipful Company of Skinners and the Worshipful Company of Merchant Tailors who are listed in this particular list as number six and number seven, respectively, they actually alternate. They take a year each at being number six and they take a year oh, each at being number seven because there's there's some debate about this, this particular order. Now, uh, Wikipedia notes that this mix-up, uh, that they switch over at Easter and the mix-up is a favourite theory for the origin of the phrase at sixes and sevens. Oh, as in to be, you know, out out of sorts, or in or in opposition or in dispute. Um, but I, I had a little look at the the origins of of that phrase, and there are there are quite a few competing theories. And the the Skinners and the Taylors, it, it seems like it's not a terribly well supported theory oh, that sixes okay. and sevens uh, comes from this. But, uh, but I, I, I do like it. It's, it notes in the Wikipedia article, it's possible that the phrase may have been coined before they resolved their dispute. Right. They both received charters in 1327 and no proof survives as to which charter was granted first. So right. there must have been some sense, not just of power, excuse me, and wealth. They must also have looked at uh, some sort of historical yeah. order within that. Um, out of the 12, which guild do you think is earliest? Would you like to take a, a guess? Oh. Uh, I mean, I'm tempted to say Mercers because I, I would have imagined that just all of the merchants at one point would have been under the same guild and they would have sort of the specializations would have grown out of those As and then with the, decided to have the their own thing. The, the it, yeah. It's actually the fishmongers, which makes a lot of sense. Right. Because before you can sell goods, especially goods to eat, you have to procure them from somewhere. So the Fishmongers gotcha. Guild, uh, Worshipful Company, I, I believe was established in 1180. Wow. Um, yeah. So I, 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 really, I really loved the, this, this notion of the, the two companies fighting. Um, but, but the livery companies of London, they, there are 110 of them. There are several professions who are still looking to become livery companies so that there's a you know there have been kind of bids from other professions like yeah. human resource professionals investment managers um they, these are people who would like to be city livery companies but but they're not right. not yet 
Um, but yeah, the, the list of, of professions is, is really cool. You know, gold and silver wire drawers, makers of player, playing cards, spectacle makers, needle makers, <laughs> all these sorts of things. See, I, uh, I, I got myself in a, a real kind of rabbit hole looking at these. And there's some really beautiful archaic words within it too. The Worshipful Company of Lauriners are the oh. people who made equestrian bits, bridles and spurs. Oh, interesting. I'd never Lauriners. heard of a Lauriner no. before. And wondered if it is perhaps a precursor of the surname Laura Murr. Oh, maybe. Which is, yeah. The surname thing is interesting because it's, you know, of course, so yeah, many sure. surnames come from these exact things. So if you know someone named Glover, Skinner, Fletcher, Tanner, Cooper, yeah, any of these other ones, yes, that's why they're called that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's funny, like, all respect to the job that human resources professionals do, but when you're talking about a long list of things that include Mercers and Coopers and Tanners and Skinners and Fishmongers and Ironmongers and Vintners and Apothecaries and Pepperers and Grocers, then you get to the Worshipful, Right, Honorable, Noble Society of Human Resource Specialists. And I'm like, oh, the world is a more boring yeah. place sometimes. I feel like that's not so much a Johnny come lately as a that ship has sailed. <laughs> I, think, I think that's probably true, but it just didn't seem to yeah. jive. But but then again, like there are like you know, chartered architects and accountants and tax advisors are on there already, so it's a mixed bag yeah, as it is. Yeah, that's true. So the the uh, the apothecaries themselves, the society was founded in 1617, and before that, London apothecaries were in the grocers' company which was founded in 1345 and in whose trade was described in 1365 as the mystery of grocers, pepperers and apothecaries. In the 14th and 15th century, the grocers, pepperers, spicers and apothecaries were the trades constituting the fraternity of St Anthony. And before that, apothecaries had been spicer apothecaries or spicers since the 12th century. They wanted their own guild for a long time and they finally separated from the grocer's company in 1617. They were granted a royal charter by James I. And then things got a little bit controversial, which is interesting. Ooh. During the remainder of the 17th century, its members, including Nicholas Culpepper, who was a friend of Samuel Pepys, challenged the College of Physicians members' monopoly of practising medicine. And... In 1704, the House of Lords overturned the ruling of the Queen's Bench in the Rose case, which effectively gave apothecaries the right to practice medicine, meaning that apothecaries may be viewed as forerunners of present day general medical practitioners or family physicians. So it's, it's very interesting to consider that there were doctors and there were other people who gave people stuff to make them better. Yeah. And I think particularly, you know, the, these days, Physicians are seen as an authority, you know, the authority on health. Yeah. And all of the other stuff is kind of seen as adjacent to that. And it's very interesting to see that historically, it was kind of the other way around. Right. Yeah. You know, when when doctors, when, when the profession of doctor first emerged, they weren't trusted. <laughs> right, know? yeah. Go and see the old lady who grows the herbs and knows about shit. And if she can't help you, maybe you can go to a doctor. Maybe then go see that, yeah. That but hey, you'll probably die anyway. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I do I find it really fascinating that that nowadays the doctors of science and experts and people who are seen as, you know, kind of unassailable in a lot of ways. Once upon a time they were the Johnny come lately's. Um, yeah. Hen and the the apothecaries didn't didn't like it. Hence all the uh, so those amazing memes and jokes about how awesome it must have been to be a doctor in the you know insert oldie timey century here. <laughs> like you know you rock up with a big mask that makes you look like a bird with a beak of stuff full of clothes, <laughs> and you're drunk, and your advice to somebody you're like your patient is that they have ghosts in their blood and they should do cocaine about it. <laughs> like, yeah, that's a that's a good day at work. It it really does sound like a fever dream, doesn't it? It sure does. Just the yeah, and they were the people who were supposed to make you better. Yeah, the past, <laughs> man, terrible. So yeah, from a from a storeroom to uh, 
general medical practice via two pie routes, um, apothecary. Neat. I thought we might have, I thought we might have come as close, because uh, I, I didn't know anything about the way apothecary was put together, which so that was very cool. But I've always loved that word, and you know, it's kind of like. Yeah. For me, I can't think like if a place has an apothecary, it also has an alchemist, you know, like, yeah, it's in that class of old timey professions for me. Yeah, definitely. And there is at least one monger in town. It doesn't matter what they're monging. <laughs> there's a monger somewhere. Like now you pretty much only have like what fear, fish, war, not a lot of other mongers around now, but back in the day, I imagine there was a bunch. I'm desperately trying to think of other mongers. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I, have to, I have to think about that. I thought that uh, we may have been going towards something where we had a, a shared etymology between the two words of an episode, but they are Ooh. thematically linked, if not etymologically linked. So my I mean, word. I, I, I know that. I know that we are but two ordinary mortal humans, but I do like to think that on the day that we do finally rock up to record with the same word, it'll be like some sort of universal paradox. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, that's that's the divide I mean, by zero time. If even a small black hole was to open up, I, I'd probably be quite gratified by that. Yeah, it'd be nice. Yeah. Something to mark the occasion anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> So my word today maybe is, not the end of, of all life as we know it. But, oh heavens no! But maybe some, <laughs> some, a, a minor extinction event, not a massive like, not the dinosaurs, just that one type of butterfly or something. Well, I mean, butterflies are, are fairly innocuous. If well, I, I could, know that, if I could but destroy we're not the reality choosing. of meetings, say. Right. If I could okay, destroy now we're the talking. universe, yeah. recreate the universe. So that it's, I mean, there are plenty worse things in the world that I could get rid of before meetings. But, you know, I, if, if I'm going to be granted this awesome power, then indeed there does come great responsibility with yeah. it. We're going to do away with it. I'd probably go for capitalism first. But Probably. Anyway. Racism, capitalism and meetings. Those are the things that our minor black hole will do away with if it ever shows up. Yeah. Those are my uh, horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Not that we're thinking above our station at all. No. Oh, no, definitely Certainly not. not. <laughs> um, my word is curator. Ooh. And so when I think of a curator now, I think a person who runs an art gallery or museum or or somebody like you, you have like Spotify's curated playlists. Like you have, you know, uh, Will Wheaton of Wesley Crusher and other fame has uh, a curated playlist on Spot Spotify about like of 80s punk and new wave stuff and it is extremely yes. good so a, i i i don't know that that he does have other fame stand by like me will wheaton is famous i feel like he's famous for being will wheaton and for being wesley crusher i guess at this point it, i mean back in the day because like stand by me and yeah so toy soldiers it's a good one oh, but stand by me i i had forgotten that, that he was in that film yeah Fair enough. But uh, so anyway, someone who runs a gallery or someone who picks and chooses the the best of it's the best stuff. of whatever type of collection or playlist or something for display and perusal. Uh, this use goes back to 1667 and the, it was the curator of the Royal Society. And I have and will post some pages of the the journal that this came out of because we live in the future and I could find a journal from 1667 and just, that's oh, awesome. there's on the page. There's where the first use of this is. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I could also, I could send you the a page of the minutes from the first meeting of the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries. Oh, that'd be that amazing. That also exists online. Yeah, we need to pu we need to put both of those up on various social meds. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's also another, so curator very, very closely re related to, um, for church nerds of a very specific, of an even more specific type, uh, in the Anglican church, the church of England more broadly, and I believe the Roman Catholic church in Ireland, a curate is like a, kind of like the, the priest. clergy, yeah, the clergy equivalent of a, a residency, a medical residency. Like it's, it is a paid position. It's like a paid internship as part of the, uh, process of ordination type of thing. And 
this is as a side note. This is also um, one of those examples of where the where there's a word, a noun, and a verb. The noun tends to have uh, the emphasis go on the first syllable, whereas if it's a verb, it goes on the last syllable. So like yeah, nice. record, sure. record, produce, produce. Cur- it actually never occurred to me that curator and curate uh, were in any way linked. Well, yeah, yeah. because that's... Cur- that's what a curator does is he, cur- he or she curates yeah, sure. to curate, but a curate is this other person, so it's that... <laughs> Type of Damn idea. you, emphasis! Right, confounded me the for all these years. Emphasis on the wrong syllable. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, so the verb to curate from curator, the more sort of commonly and uh, widely known form of this word, the verb curate shows up. What? When would you guess? So the curator, the noun, the the role, sixteen sixty seven. When do you think the verb? arrives in English. I I would have expected it to be pretty early, partly because of the form. It sounds very Latinate. Right. So if it's a word that's come to us directly from Latin, then you're probably talking about like maybe even 12th, 13th century, something like that. Okay. Yeah, that's reasonable. 1934. What? Is when it shows up in writing in the Webster's, in a Webster's dictionary. <laughs> Um, I love knowing absolutely nothing. <laughs> well, I would have guessed the same. I would have been like, because so often, it, well, this, and this is another ongoing thing where it's like kind of you flip a coin, whether the word for a role came from the job that role did or the other way around yeah. and which way yeah. it went. And it, it can go either way. And in this case, it absolutely went the other way. Um, yeah. There's an earlier, like in 1870. Uh, curated as one of those attributive adjective things shows up, like a curated collection. Okay. But that's also very weird because it's it's a verb form, like an adjective that looks like it comes from a verb, like a curated collection. You'd look at that and go, surely that must be because that collection has been curated. Yeah, that makes sense. But the verb doesn't show up, even that doesn't show up till 1870. And the verb doesn't show up for another 60 years. So that's, yeah. uh, (laughs) Yeah, various noises of that type. Yeah, it's it's bizarre. So That's very bizarre. (laughs) So the noun, the the church nerd uh, paid internship for a priest version, the curate, that goes back to 1557. So it's meant a, a paid internship in the Anglican church since 1557 and before that and back to the 1300s it was just the word for the head the, the priest of the parish oh, the main clear okay. at the time clergyman um but the main cleric in charge of a whole parish was the curate of that parish oh that's very interesting i didn't know that so yeah it's uh so it's it's a it's a big kind of jumble so far and I've done yeah. very little to allay anyone's confusion, and I'm I'm not about to now. So, um, <laughs> the, the next stop in the this journey through time of which came first, the verb or the noun, is we go to the word from which we get curate and curator, and eventually curate. Uh, it's the word to cure. Yeah, and that's where they both come when from. When you said. When, when you first said about, you know, thematic uh, crossover between our, our words and you said curator, literally for the first time in my life, I thought, does this have anything to do with curing people? Yeah. And if so, ooh, but also, duh, why didn't you realise that before? <laughs> it's right there in the word. Well, and this is why I, I really thought we were about to arrive at that magical point where we had a connected etymology between the two of them, because... In your word, the apothecary, and you went, there's two pie roots. And I went, surely the carry part of that is one of those pie roots. But no, it was the apo and the <laughs> the part. I was like, no, we're missing the one part that might have linked the two words. But that's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the, uh, the verb to cure, uh, and again, this is the verb... This time the verb shows up first, or um, sorry, this time the noun shows up first again. The, the verb to cure arrives in the late 1300s, like very end okay. of the 1300s, 
whereas the noun, a cure, shows up right at the very beginning, literally like 1300 or 1301 or whatever, is the first written citation of the, the noun cure. And the earliest meaning of cure was simply care. To right. care for okay. someone was to cure them and vice versa. And it comes I mean, from... I, I'm, I'm going to take a wild stab and say that, that cures per se weren't awesome. Probably not. In history. Yeah, like there was a <laughs> there there was a ceiling on one's medical optimism in the past, I think. Yeah. You know, like I, I'm gonna guess that quite a lot of people who got sick didn't get better. Yeah. Like something yeah, like you were you're probably gonna die, but just how much will it suck on the way to that is sort yeah. of the the best cure you could hope for, I think, in the thirteen hundreds. Also b- before you're thirty five. Oh heavens yes. No, if you've You've been cured if you hit 40. Like, you're you're fine. <laughs> um, but it comes from the Latin word uh, meaning to care. And the medical use of a, a cure comes in 1393. So that's, like, specific to curing a medical, a medical ailment or a, right. a remedy for a medical ailment. Sorry. Because that's the noun. The verb shows up in the Wycliffeite Bible in 1384, right. as in to cure a medical ailment. This is this thing keeps back and they keep jumping back and forth, and it's very very hard to figure out ultimately which one did come first, whether it's the verb or the noun in this case. Except for again, curator and curate, which is just really bizarre. And this highlights why that's so bizarre, because normally they're just muddled together, and like it it means a medical thing. And in that case, the verb shows up a little bit before the noun, but everything else is the noun before the verb. But they're all close. They all, you know, within the same century, at least. Ryan, my brain is hard to hang. I know. Um, the sense of uh, to cure something, as in, uh, like cured meats or food. Oh, I hadn't even hadn't even got as far as thinking about that. That shows up in print in sixteen thirty three. Deliciously. Deliciously, exactly. So yeah, salting, smoking, drying meat or whatever for. Uh, pre-refrigerator storage and um, consumption alongside cheese yeah, yeah, oh, especially enthusiastically and especially um, the sense of uh, other kind of manufacturing uses so uh, allowing concrete to cure or sure. curing rubber or plastic so that it's either harder or softer or more or less brittle depending on what it is you're intending for it mm-hmm. that sense shows up first in the mid 1800s in uh, a paper on the vulcanization of rubber by Mr. Charles Goodyear, from which we get the tire brand. Nice. And so he's talking about curing rubber in the mid-1800s. Uh, going back to Proto-Indo-European and Pokorny's Pi Lexicon at the University of Texas at Austin's Linguistics Research Center, for the full shout-out to this citation source. Yeah, I, I really wish they had an acronym, because it's quite long. It, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, right now it's plu, plu, uh, Pocorny's Plutalric, Plutalric, which is hard. I wish they had a better acronym. I agree. Yeah. The yeah. Pyrute. They just need to call it like, I don't know, Bingo or something. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> his name is a totally random. I like it. Actually, what they need to do is they have to have a competition for all of its users to suggest a wonderful oh, name. Oh, that is what they have and to And offer have. some sort of <clears throat> like soft toy prize, something like that. that. That's how these things are best settled, yeah. isn't it? I think so. I think that's. I think we need to have that. If anyone can come up with a good, <laughs> solid name change for the Pocorny's Pi Lexicon at the University of Texas at Austin's Linguistics Research Center. <laughs> can't believe I got through that. And we could just call it Flurb or something, you know, like just come yeah. up with something that's awesome and send it to us because I think that'd be <laughs> hilarious. Uh, the the pie root for this word is I, I just kois, K-O-I-S, and it means okay. to cure or to worry or to care for. So again, even for time immemorial, those two things have been linked up. And this, the ancestors or the descendants of this root, excuse me, are words like accurate, as in taking care to be precise, secure, as you know, to worry and care for someone like that, Uh, manicure and pedicure, 
Same cure there as yeah. caring for your toes and fingers. Caring for your hands yep. or your feet. And the word sure comes from from this as well. Sure. As in to be certain. Yeah. And to be oh, nice. And and I, something that is sure is settled and stable. Cured. And cured. Yeah. So there's uh oh, that's awesome. curator. Curate, curing, caring, making hockey pucks and tires and bacon, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> what a legacy. Hockey pucks, tires and bacon. I mean, I like those things. And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.